Welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Whitney Keys, the Executive Director of Seattle City Club. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year and recognizing the lasting vision of our founders. They saw the need to strengthen the civic health of our region by ensuring everyone had access to critical information as well as connection to elected officials and other community leaders to engage in ways that improve and impact our democracy. In this month of May, there's a lot going on, starting with Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. This recognizes the influence and contributions of these communities on our history, our culture, and their achievements in the United States. Today is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, when many Americans celebrate with beer and nachos, not knowing the history behind this holiday. On this day back in 1862, a small Mexican army successfully fought against much stronger French forces, preventing French rule. There's more to the story, but this is the foundation behind it and what's become an annual celebration of Mexican American culture. I'm committed to learning more about these issues, impacting these communities and others. And Seattle City Club's ongoing diversity, equity, and inclusion work respects our shared history, and reflects diverse voices and expertise in all of our programs. Civic Cocktail is just one way that we do this, and we deeply thank Comcast, our presenting partner. We also want to recognize the Seattle Channel as our longtime media partner and Town Hall as our program partner. As we look ahead to June, we're partnering with Native leaders in our region to host a three-part series. It's a virtual civic boot camp, and it's going to be focused on Native leadership in the Salish Sea region. Through a series of conversations and panel discussions, we'll examine their roles and responsibility and contributions within our civic landscape as they work with the United States government and non-tribal organizations to manage natural resources and address social, environmental, and public health issues. When Civic Cocktail begins in just a few minutes, we invite you to be part of the conversation. You can do this by typing your question in the chat box, and please note the person that you would like to answer your question. At the conclusion of the live recorded program, the live stream will continue for about 15 minutes so we can just focus on answering your questions. As always, we're committed to ensuring that this is a civil conversation and respectful exchange of ideas. This continues to be a very challenging time and a tough year for many of us, especially nonprofits that do events-based programming like Seattle City Club and Town Hall. So please consider making a gift to help us continue to produce these programs. During and after Civic Cocktail, you'll have the chance to donate online or you can text to give. Just text the word CIVICS to the number 44321 and whatever you give will be appreciated and support our organization. So thank you so much. And now it's that time to grab the drink of your choice, sit back, relax, and watch Civic Cocktail with our host, journalist Joni Balter. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Civic Cocktail. I'm Joni Balter. We have a terrific show for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We are talking about Seattle's beloved and right now bedraggled downtown. With us to discuss how we might restore our superstar tech hub, Bob Donegan, former chairman of the Seattle Chamber and currently president of Ivor's Restaurants, and Brian Surratt, former director of the Seattle Office of Economic Development, now vice president of real estate and community relations for the Alexandria Real Estate Company. So let's get to this, Bob. A lot of changes downtown during the last year. What are some of the aha numbers of lost businesses and lost jobs? So Joni, it's been bad news and good news with good news in increasing recently. <clears throat> As an example, 360,000 people normally work downtown. And at the bottom of the trough last April and May, only 8.6% of those people were coming to work. As of last month, April, the Downtown Seattle Association estimates that 20% of those 360,000 people are coming to work. That's good news. We've seen an increase in traffic on Interstate 5. Norm Wait, is that good news? <laughs> Well, it means more people are coming to town and passing through town. In a normal 
uh, period, Interstate 5 at South Lake Union sees about a million vehicles a day. In April and May last year, it was down to 600,000 vehicles a day. And now we're back up to a million. So people are out and about more. Residency, typically 84,000 people live downtown in apartments and condos. In last spring and summer, about a third of them were not living downtown. And about 1,203 apartment people left downtown. Most of those people have come back. And in the first quarter of 2021, 907 new people have moved into downtown. So there was bad news and it's improving gradually. The Downtown Seattle Association tracks the number of business openings and closures. And despite a loss of about 275 businesses downtown, the latest list shows 24 new business openings in downtown in the last few months. The bulk of them are restaurants, but there's also pet care, financial services, salons, and some retail. So downtown is slowly in this spring season starting to come back to life. So bring you in here, Brian, and, and setting the table, as you said earlier, um, how do you see the trend lines downtown? You know, there, I'm sure you saw that article in the Seattle Times um, earlier this week that talked about demand for office space actually rebounding a lot. What did you think of that? Well, I think, um, you know, to Bob's point, um, you know, the reality is 2020 was hard. It was hard on our, our, our town and our central uh, business district. Um, uh, but we're also starting to see glimmers of hope. You know, there is light at that end of the proverbial tunnel. And, and when I think about last year, you know, it's been really a period of, of, of reflection and, and reckoning and, and hopefully what I believe to be a renaissance uh, for the, our community. And the, what we need to recognize, though last year, it wasn't just the pandemic that we're dealing with. It was a pandemic and then the subsequent economic and fiscal fallout that we saw. And then on top of that, this, you know, this social justice movement on uh, that, that really uh, captured all of us because we had nothing else to do but sit at home and watch this happen and happen not only in our city, but across the country. Uh, but that being said, I, I, I feel so strongly about this city. Um, you know, cities have always been a powerful human uh, organizing uh, force. Um, and I really do believe that, that we have to kind of step back. And, and when, I, when I said reflection, being able to step back and recognize that humans and cities have endured pandemics before. And if anything, um, they have emerged stronger better imagined, uh, more productive um, as, as, as communities and again, as organizing tools. And I just believe that the kind of the, um, the clustering force of cities uh, will be more powerful than, than, than this pandemic in, in the long run. Um, so all those glimmers that, that Bob noted at the end, I, I think they're tracking and, and they're signaling something really powerful. Well, let me stay with you for a second, Brian. I just wanna ask you, so small business, they really, so many small businesses had such a rough year uh, and, and experienced so many closures and so many troubles. And I'm just wondering, like, as you look like today and, and, you know, maybe it's like some of the office space or something like that, but how would you describe the state of small businesses downtown today? Well, I, it's, I think there, you know, 2020 again was, was devastating. Um, especially to small businesses. Um, and I think another thing that people learned, um, and, and it was frankly, it was, it was a shock lesson around how interconnected this economy is, that the upper floors of uh, our office buildings, um, they are um, not only um, you know, essential to uh, just kind of productivity and innovation are down type four, but they're essential to the survival to those small businesses on the ground floor, that the reason why non-workers and residents want to flock to downtown because they want to uh, frequent um, uh, those establishments on the ground. And so they have been uh, decimated. You know, my fear, and, and actually Bob mentioned this uh, in, in um, the conversation before the call, around you know what will small business look like going forward you know what what will be the nature of, of, of those small businesses going forward and 
Um, again, what I still believe that I, there, I think there's something powerful about the DNA of Seattle, like, okay, yes, small businesses have been hit hard and, and we are going to, it, it's tragic that we we've lost so many. And at the same time, I think there's room. I think there's room for new ideas, new entrepreneurs wanting to make their mark um, in Seattle. I think there's new opportunities for them to do so. Joey, Bob, what's the start of 2020? There were about 14,000 restaurants and hotels in Washington state. The State Hospitality Association is estimating that after Corona ends, let's say Labor Day of 2021, we'll have 5,000 fewer restaurants and hotels in Washington state. Wow. Hospitality is the single biggest employment industry in the state, 304,000 people. In April and May of 2020, 196,000 of those 304,000 people were collecting unemployment from the state. That's two thirds of the workforce. So you're right, small business was whacked by Corona. And not all of them will survive because they don't have the staff to spend the time applying for small business loans or PPP loans because they're busy cooking in the kitchen and scheduling labor and accepting the deliveries. It will be different in the future than it has been in the past. And just, just, a, and just oh, to follow up, just, just quickly just on that point is like, yes, have we seen, um, again, this is something that Bob noted earlier, like we've seen in a massive amounts of new resources um, coming to small businesses, you know, um, during it, with this current administration. Unfortunately, it's too late for a lot of the businesses that, that were just, uh, just wiped out uh, from 2020. Um, so it's, it's unfortunate kind of where we are right now. So, um, you know, COVID, remote work, these are clearly the, the main culprits. But I'd like to hear from both of you what you think, um, how much public safety concerns in Seattle are now playing into uh, probably a slower recovery than we might have seen. Why don't you go first, Bob? About six weeks ago, we saw a change in the explanation for why people weren't coming downtown. Um, there are 45 businesses on the waterfront and we talk to our customers all the time. And the reason they weren't coming last year and up until the middle of March was because of concern about Corona. Since St. Patrick's Day, the reason they're not coming downtown is because they perceive it to be dirty, unsafe, and they don't wanna be here because of the media coverage of the perception that downtown is unsafe. Brian, what do you think of that? You know, um, I was talking to the interim Seattle police chief, uh, Adrian Diaz for, for a different show, and he was talking about uh, the staffing crisis. I mean, they're down to Seattle police, down 200 officers. Uh, that leaves them, I think, with the uh, de a de number of deployable officers, deployable, of uh, 1,088. So do you think, what's your take on this? What do you think? No, I think it's, um, I think Bob, um, I think really pointed to something that we've got to address as a community. Um, you know, real or perceived uh, public safety is, um, is a challenge in our community. And, you know, I think part of the challenge has been, um, you know, downtown has been vacant for so long and when you don't have people when you don't have bodies walking through and interacting with each other um you're, you're going to notice um uh, a lot of these issues more clearly and also it becomes a bit of a vacuum for people to come in and 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 do things that that, that really are damaging to to our communities um uh, as regard to um, our, our police force um, we are um, on on the doorsteps of what I believe is a crisis in policing right now. Uh, that we're uh, losing. That how we're would you going. describe that crisis? What I, I think I think it's twofold. The crisis is twofold. One, um, I think any modern city um, that that has a um, a critical city function that cannot be properly staffed and maintained um, is a crisis. Um, it's also a crisis of confidence with the police force um, here in Seattle with community members. And uh, they're, they're, they're related, but they're also very distinct. And so the question for Seattle becomes, how do we create a culture uh, within the city's uh, police department that can retain and continue to um, 
uh, grow and invest in the best officers and also um, maintain trust with with community, and particularly communities of color. I think those th that's where uh, when I want to talk about crisis, it's, it's twofold. They're related, but they're very distinct. So, Joni, we had an incident at the end of February in Pioneer Square. The city was getting people out of Pioneer Square, Occidental Square, into services. And there was a group of tents that the people weren't eligible for services because they drove luxury cars. And the police ended up arresting them and finding meth and crack and fentanyl and cash and weapons. And when they appeared before the judge, they didn't get bail. They didn't get time in jail. They were released on their personal recognizance. And I talked with some of the officers after. What kind of incentive do you think that gives them to do their best to keep downtown safe? What's the status of that, of that right now? Do you know? I tried to find out today, and I couldn't get an update, so I don't know. Okay, Doug, so um, I want to zoom out a little bit. You know, some of the things we're talking about here today are happening in so many other cities. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, different cities compare themselves to, to different cities. But sometimes we're compared to, say, San Francisco or New York. You can compare us to as many of those as you want. But, you know, are we unique in what we're experiencing? It's possible that we are. You know, we were at the top of all the lists, those uh, best cities to do business or be in business or live and all that. Uh, is, our, is it a big fall from grace for us? Is that, is that why we're unique or are we just like these other cities? Go ahead, Bob. So when Kathleen O'Toole was the police chief, the city of Seattle passed the city of Boston for population. Yeah. The city of Boston had roughly twice as many authorized police officers as the 1,340 that Seattle has. Do you know how many homeless people are allowed to be on the street in Boston tonight? I actually don't. None. Because they will take them off the street and they will get them a hotel or they will get them housing. There are other cities around the country who f have found ways to do it. And we've been in this housing crisis, this homeless housing crisis, for five years and still are not making big improvements to it. I think it's why the Compassion Seattle people with this initiative are getting such strong response that the community wants those people to get into treatment and off the street to make the street safer, both for them and for the community. So Brian, what kind of um, comparisons do you make to Seattle, you know, our, our experience now of trying to recover from this pandemic? So, so here's what I, I want, I'll be really honest with, with you. Last summer, I grew really, really, summer in the fall, really frustrated with a lot of the national narrative about Seattle. I can't tell you the amount of times I got phone calls from my friends and family in the Midwest on the East Coast asking, are you okay, Brian? Are you okay? Thinking that Seattle is an absolute war zone. And same thing with, with San Francisco and other cities. And, and I, what I don't want us is to fall into and buy into that, that, that narrative about how Seattle um, is dead and it's far from them. Sometimes as Seattleites, I feel like we fall prey to that and we, we double down on that. And I, and, and I just want I just, I just want to say that really just loud and clear. Do we have our challenges? Absolutely, absolutely. And, but we're, you know, I just, I just, I just. Well, well hang on a second there. So yeah. I, I, I would like to know how much that national trash talk of Seattle uh, impacts our downtown. I mean, did it make you less likely to go there or people that you know, oh, I'm not going downtown. I mean, Sean Hannity on Fox sometimes, every time he was talking about Seattle, I got the same phone calls you've got. Mm -hmm. I'm sure mm -hmm. lots of people did. Every time he was talking about Seattle, he'd have like all caps across the screen, crazy town or, you know, um, absolutely can't make it economically. They would say all these things about Seattle just in, in a slump or, you know, they'd really picked on Seattle. Did, did that change behavior? Absolutely not. If not well, I'll tell you, with, with me and my uh, kind of family unit, we all live in West Seattle. Every weekend, we go, to, we go downtown. Sunday morning is almost ritual, Pike Place Market. Saturday, Chinatown ID for bubble tea and for uh, Chinese food. That is, 
that is our, you know, uh, we made it a point to come to downtown because we didn't want to fall, ca you know, fall captive to um, um, this 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 narrative that, again, I think it was it, it spoke to some some truth in the sense of like where where does this city go when it comes to reinvesting in in such an important part of who we are, uh, but also I you know the 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 doom and gloom and the fear mongering I, it, it it really it really um, uh, rubbed me the wrong way because part of it is what we need going forward is is action it is is a commitment to a place that we all love and so. Um, and I want that that energy to come from a place of of, of excitement for what the future can look like. You know, I, I obviously don't want to be Pollyannish about it. It's like there's some real challenges that we have to deal with. And I agree with Bob uh, that that the, the 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 public reaction to um, Compassion Seattle speaks to um, folks wanting to say, okay, we've we've we, what we have right now or what we had prior to the pandemic and what we endured is not tenable anymore. We have to try something new and different. And that's the energy that, that I get excited about. So Bob, I wanted to ask you about the trash talking. Did you, you know, I'm sure maybe you got the same phone calls from friends across the country, but do you think that impacted locals or people from around the Puget Sound region from saying, well, I'm not, you know, I saw that on Fox, so I'm for sure, I'm not going downtown. We know it's true. When oh. we ask regulars to the waterfront, hey, how come we haven't seen you in a while? they'll tell us that they feel unsafe coming downtown. And we remind them that the waterfront is different from downtown. Is we this anecdotal have... or, you know, it, It's anecdotal. Or what? Yeah. Everything's anecdotal in the last year. There's not been much market research done. But here's another data point for you. In January, February of 2020, 2019, the Pike Place Market got 10 to 12,000 visitors a day. In April and May, it got none. Last month, the Pike Place Market was averaging 10 to 12,000 visitors a day. So that's not all Brian's family. There's other people coming to town as got well. A big family. Got a big family, Bob. He's got a large family, I would say. And so uh, it's busy in town. We see the traffic on Interstate 5. We see lots of families riding bikes, walking the waterfront, coming to the new Pier 62 concert pier. Yeah, it's busy in sections down here. We just need the people to come back to work. Well, that's, that's a perfect segue uh, to um, the impact of arts and culture uh, on the recovery, on the just overall feelings to downtown. So you have the aquarium is open, you have uh, Sam, Wing Luke Museum, those are open. The Moore Theater, the Paramount, the big music venue is still closed and uh, restaurants at 50% uh, capacity for at least another two weeks. Uh, you know how much how how impactful is that on the overall feel of downtown, Bob? It's, it's clearly impactful. The aquarium, which has a self-imposed limit of 15% of capacity, is selling out. The the Mar Mariners and the Seahawks or the Mariners and the Sounders, are filling their stadium, at the 7,000 at Sounders and 9,000 at Mariners, that they proposed and they've been limited to. The Tacoma Rainiers yesterday came up with a very clever idea, which was if you're vaccinated, you can come into the stadium with no attendance cap and the state bought off on it today. I think it'll be pretty quick before the Mariners and the Seahawks and the Sounders and the rain agree to the same thing. And when those people come into town um, and see that it's not as unsafe as they thought it is, they come back. Brian. Your thoughts on the, the impact of arts and culture and some of these openings, this, you know, some of the hope maybe here. So my uh, my family were members of the Seattle Art Museum, and you know we've made our appointments to um, see the the latest Jacob Lawrence installation, and we're excited to go. We're excited to go back to these these treasures, and I think there's so much pent up demand um, to go. And, you know, I'm already, you know, um, kind of tracking, uh, you know, my friends who, um, you know, who've got their vaccines. Okay, all right, you, you get it? Where, when, when's, your, when's your second appointment? You Wait, know, has anybody, not, has anybody not shared a vaccine anywhere in the world <laughs> that they got the vaccine? I, exactly, exactly. Well, part of it's like, so we can start putting stuff on the calendar and start 
going back to downtown because I think you know, this is where you know the, the the renaissance piece comes into this. So, yes, are we concerned about you know, office vacancy rates um, and slowly um, um, getting back to to normal? Are we concerned about what's happening on the retail? What I will say about Seattle's arts community, it's it has um, been resilient. Uh, the broader community has had its back and supported it. And when those doors do open, I there, there's going to be lines of people waiting uh, to come in. And to Bob's point, being smart about our vaccines and, and start as incentivizing people. And I think this is where I think public health and, and public policy um, for the past 12 months hasn't quite got it right, you know, because part of like we didn't know, we, we knew so little about the virus and how it would, it would impact folks. But the little tricks that, 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 you know, Bob mentioned around like, if you're vaccinated, you can come in and we can go above and beyond what, what, the, what the cap is. Like those are the types of incentives that we need to lay out for folks. And it's like, okay, do your part, get vaccinated, protect yourself, protect your family. And you know what, once you do that, you can go back to normal, whatever that, that was and start living again. And especially the timing has been um, great because we're entering you know, the summer months you know, where people want to be outside, want to start, start engaging uh, with their community. So it, it's, it's there, we're on the cusp of it. And did you see the clever thing that the Mariners did yesterday? You can show up at the game go out to Edgar's Cantina in left mm -hmm. field and get a vaccination without mm -hmm. an appointment. Mm -hmm. The Sounder similar story made the NBC national news last night. So arts and culture is a great way to communicate with people and get them into town. So Brian, um, John Scholes at the Downtown Seattle Association says we have to give people intentional new opportunities mm -hmm. to come back downtown. What's a good example of that? Oh, wow. That's, that's so good. You know, we, it's so interesting when I was at the city, um, our streets, you know, our, our public right of ways were arguably some of the most over-regulated uh, assets that the city has had, you know, and everyone has a stake in it because it's, you know, they, they are public right of ways. They belong to all of us, but what the pandemic and the economic fallout force us to do was, you know what, we need to expand our imagination on what streets can be, right? And so there's always been this movement around, you know, kind of pulling out and using the streets as gathering places. Um, and, and if anything, the pandemic has been an, an accelerant for these things. And so when I go downtown and so, into some of the neighborhood business districts and seeing, you know, people literally in tables in the street and people walking and like that is that is what could be and so what john is talking about though some of those intentional things i know some of my downtown business friends are are, are going to say this is this is crazy but what if we were to open up you know um and make it car free you know the pike pine corridor once a month you know um you know you know, no more cars in Pike Place Market for a, a week or whatever. Just, just as that draw to kind of get people in, and and in, in a very, because um, you want people to have experience, you want them to congregate. And that's what you. That's what downtowns are meant to be. It's clustering, bringing people together. And so, what what are those sparks? And and I think our streets are an important part of that. So, Bob, Brian, what do you think many, of yeah on that? Brian, how many people does the city employ in the Muni Tower? I think, if I recall, I don't know, 8,000, oh. 9,000, you know, something, something like that, yeah. So I've been unsuccessful in getting the city to bring people to work back downtown. Mm -hmm. That would be a great first step to indicating that it was safe down here and bringing some life to the upper part of downtown. Well, to that exact point, Bob, you know, Amazon, 55,000 employees strong, is saying that employees, um, must come back or most of them must come back by fall. Isn't that an important uh, switch? The Downtown <laughs> Seattle Association yeah. is tracking employers and when they're bringing people back to work or allowing people to come back to work. There's a cluster that are coming back in June. There's another cluster coming back after Labor Day. There's a huge cluster coming back in December. And I think if the city brought people back to work, it would accelerate the other organizations to bring people downtown. They miss coming to work. 
they miss seeing each other. I, I agree with you 100 percent, Bob. You know, it's it's it'd be actually a, a, frankly a poetic bookend to how um, Seattle and King County started its pandemic response when you had the county executive. Uh, you had Amazon, you had Microsoft saying, this is what we're going to do. And that sent a signal to the marketplace. Okay, folks, our largest employers in the region, our, our, our government uh, is going to take these actions. And to Bob's point on the bookend, you know, Amazon's already making those signals. You know, I think it'd be great for our large, one of our larger downtown employers to send that same signal to the folks like downtown is not only open for business, but it's, it's you know, we, we want we want folks to come back. So Brian, um, I think we're kind of getting somewhere here. Uh, this urban studies theorist, Richard Florida, I don't know if you've heard his name. He says some mid-sized cities like Portland, Austin and Boise could rebound more quickly than, than a city like Seattle, for example, because they wrote specific comeback plans. Do you know if Seattle has any such plans? I mean, we're talking about maybe the city does it, Amazon's helping, but is there a specific comeback plan uh, that could help us in that regard, and is there one? Well, I do know that uh, John uh, Stoles and 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 uh, Pamela Banks uh, from the city, uh, they're co-chairing um, uh, the city's resiliency task force. They've got a broad group of, of of stakeholders who are really diving into this question right now. What will it take for the city uh, to bounce back? So, um, you know, the, I think the beauty of of Seattle, when Seattle works. It's uh, at, at its best. It is that coalition of government, of business, of community leaders, really rolling up their sleeves and saying, "This is how we're going to to move forward." So I'm not familiar with Portland's plan, but um, I'm really confident in, in the leadership of John and Pamela and the rest of that that task force to to, to guide us. At the same time, you know, it's 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 really important to have those critical market signals that okay, here here's what, what what's happening, and also. No, I, again, I, I, I don't, I, 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 I want to, you know, I don't want to undersell this. People want to be together. And I think, I would hope sometime this summer, end of the summer, when we hit a point where we've got enough you know, vaccination take up that we have some, some sort of celebration um, to, to really mark, um, you know, not the end of the pandemic, uh, because we don't know what that really is but really signaling to the beginning of something new and different um, and what, what downtown could really look like. It doesn't have to be this hyper plan thing, but just something that, that really signals like we're moving forward as, as, as a community. So I have a question, an audience question from Cam for both Bob Donegan and Brian Surratt. How, how can we come back stronger than ever in a way that is equitable? Bob? So, so the first thing I think we have to do is we have to make the downtown safe so that everybody feels welcome to come back here. Going back to your last question, <clears throat> I believe there are more economic recovery task forces operating on this issue right now than there are Zoom meetings in a week. <laughs> Greater Seattle Partners has one, the city has one, the chamber has one, the PSRC has one, and the number one principle that every one of them declares is this has to be an equitable recovery for all. So that's the top principle that everybody's working on. Brian, you said something to me um, during our prep about that exact thought. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's so interesting. Um, some of the national uh, talking heads and think pieces are talking about, oh, are, are we going to experience, you know, the equivalent of the in the 1920s, Roaring Twenties, right? You know, was some of the the most expansive economic gains ever. You know, the stock market just went nuts. You know, the, the huge. Economic I'm heavily recovery. into the Roaring Twenties. I think that would be great. Well, but but yeah, and you know, and well, and also not just on the cultural side, like the Jazz Age, Harlem, Harlem Renaissance, like all these, all this flourishing happening. But at the same time, it was one of the most unequal economic recoveries. And and then a decade not, you know, later, you saw the rise of fascism. You saw economic global economic collapse. The question becomes, what do we do? Like, can we take some of those lessons of the Roaring Twenties to have this, this amazing economic recovery? But what are those questions around other folks who have been left out of that economy? There are a couple of things that I'm really 
um, I, I'm hopeful with downtown. Um, and these are these are foundational elements that uh, the city and community leaders have invested in since the 1990s. You know when downtown was mostly you know a commerce place, I mean, your 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 traditional central business district. But we've got what 84,000 residents now in in downtown Seattle. We've got some of the highest concentration of of affordable housing. We need to have more of that coming into downtown. When we talk about an equitable recovery, more and more people of all income stripe uh, levels need to be living in downtown. We need to have more um, uh, African Americans and 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 Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans living in downtown to be a, really a part of that community. It can no longer just solely be perceived as a place where you go to work and you go back to your communities. You know, what does a complete downtown community look like and and that part of that question requires it to be uh, to, to to have this equity focus and part of that equity focus is people living together people living in the same community and 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 accessing the same services going to the same shops attending the same shows and 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 really um, taking advantage of all those uh, opportunities that um, a dynamic downtown presents something yeah, remember um, Joni. Oh, okay Plans don't get things done, people get things done. If you look at the characteristics of the leading candidates for mayor, it's as diverse a group as you can find. Colleen Echohawk, a Native American, Lance Randall, a black guy, Bruce Harrell, black and Asian, Lorena Gonzalez. They're the ones who will drive the recovery next year and they come from different backgrounds than we've normally seen in Seattle. Um, question for Jeff, for Bob Donegan, uh, audience question. Will restaurants continue with pandemic related trends of providing additional outdoor seating and extended takeout and delivery options from what you know? Yeah, what do you think? Indeed, Jeff, if you look at the learnings that restaurants have made in the last year, if everybody could find a drive through he or she would do that for the restaurant. If you look at the investments that restaurants have made in technology that allow people to order online, identify their license plate, show up at a restaurant and pick up their food without having to go in, that will continue. Now in our case, in January 2020, about 2% of Ivor's sales were delivery sales. In April and May, at the bottom of Corona, 40% of our revenues came from delivery sales. And now that we're starting to open up again, yesterday it was at 17%. But it's not going away. And there will be more and more ways for people to get food delivered to them or easily picked up or more outdoor dining. Have you seen these goofy little greenhouses? They're mm -hmm. great in Seattle where it doesn't get sunny and hot. But if these were in Phoenix or Scottsdale or the Palm Desert, we'd have cooked people in there. But there are well, other interesting things that we see in Seattle. I thought, I thought some of those that I saw didn't look terribly COVID safe. But anyway, I got, I got to check in with you on one thing, Bob Donegan, and that is on cruise ships. Um, they're not coming to Seattle or maybe a small number later in the year. And my question really has to do with the impact uh, for you, what is it as you know it on small businesses, you know, who rely on that part of the tourist trade? So we got our hopes up last week when the Centers for Disease Control issued new guidance that allowed cruise ships to continue operating. And then the Senate, primarily driven by the Alaska delegation, but supported by Maria Cantwell, came up with an exemption to the Passenger Vessel Service Act, which would allow ships from Seattle to go to Alaska and not have to stop in Victoria on the way back. They were present, this bill was presented in the Senate on Monday and Conra uh, Senator Lee from Utah vetoed it and because it was a unanimous consent requirement, a single person could stop it. So they're working to make that happen. It would be good news for Seattle if cruises can resume late in July or August, every time one of those cruise ships docks here, it buys four and a half million dollars worth of goods and services. It's a green industry because most of the port's locations use shore power, not the polluting um, diesel power. And 
the typical visitor who takes a cruise to Alaska comes two days earlier, stays two days late, and visits the museums with Brian, and goes to a Mariners game, and stays in downtown hotels, and goes to the Olympic Mountains or down to Rainier. So we're hoping something comes back. We're not optimistic based on the Senate's action earlier this week. So Brian, when you and I were uh, prepping for this show on the phone, uh, you said something that I, thought, I found really interesting. You said that the discourse about Seattle business is sometimes infantile, binary, zero sum. Meaning, meaning what exactly? No, well, it's um, it's actually related to um, the, the earlier question around what does equitable uh, recovery look like. So I'll, I'll get to to, to that. Um, um, I think the challenge with politics and our discourse in Seattle is um, we have a tendency to simplify really complex issues. We, What's an example in this regard? Um, oh, gosh. Um, Defund the police. That's a good one. You know, I think it's, I think it's a really good one. Um, we have a, we have a, a, a tendency to vilify um, the others and to and, and to a point where it is zero sum. You know, where there is there's a winner and a loser, and it becomes so um, and it becomes these 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 gestures, right? And and not real uh, progress and 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 movement. And it's been interesting for me when I left the city three and a half years ago, um, and 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 wanting to understand deeper, you know, kind of other, you know, other aspects of the community. And and when we talk about the business community, it's not a monolith, you know, and 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 it's not it, it, it's not this this boogeyman. When I think about all the big um, uh, efforts that really have transformed the city, uh, that frankly labor and um, uh, you know, progressives have been behind. The business community has always been there as well. From transportation to housing to education, the business community has always been there. Um, and so the, 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 the frustration that I have with the conversation is, is oftentimes businesses is, is not brought to the table to address some of these really, really hard, hard questions. Um, it's been interesting for the last, you know, eight months since the height of last summer, the height of uh, the, the, the racial reckoning, um, is getting back to the question of what, what does equitable recovery look like? I have been genuinely shocked, uh, pleasantly shocked, how a lot of members of the business community have been asking the question around what, what, does, what does this ra racial reckoning really mean? What does it mean for us? What, where's, where's our compl you know, complicity in, in a system that has been systemically um, uh, racist against uh, uh, black and brown folks and Asian folks and Native Americans? And so, so there have been real conversations that um, folks in the business community have. You know, I'm a member of the Downtown Seattle Association, and that's a conversation that we've had, we've had at the board level. Uh, have there been easy conversations? Absolutely not. But those are conversations that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I would venture to guess that that, that topic is not coming at, up at all in that, in that particular circle. So I'm running out of time here, but I do have a final audience question from Kevin for both Bob Donegan and Brian Surratt. We'll start with you, Bob, and if you're tight, we'll be able to get to Brian. And if not, maybe not. <laughs> How can we create... Um, downtown spaces with a sense of beauty and art that are evidence of the renaissance we're all trying to imagine. Even if you come downtown Seattle today and walk the neighborhoods, you will see the plywood fronts on buildings that have been covered over by artists. If you look back at the Seattle Times Pacific section of a few months ago, Jean Sherrard photographed dozens of them. They're gorgeous. So come on down. There's beauty everywhere down here. Brian, real quickly. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about, the, every time I go downtown, oh. I, I like to drive along the waterfront and what is that transformation has been amazing. I think about what's happening with Climate Pledge Arena at Seattle Center, um, just to the north of the downtown core. Um, you know, the, the convention center 
what Matt Griffin and, and his partners are doing there. This city is investing in itself because it believes in itself. And, and you know, money also wants to make money. And, and that is also, so it's not just sentiment here. Capital is following and betting on Seattle. And, and I, I, I hope that, that we can all muster the energy um, to, um, you know, to, to really support, again, this, this renaissance that's coming. And Bob, just really briefly, you know, uh, the waterfront, we, the, the infrastructure projects proceeded, <clears throat> expanding the convention center. Are, do they, will they happen in time? Will they be able to help the renaissance we're speaking of? Well, the good news about the J.P. Morgan public finance debt for the convention center that came out two weeks ago, that project will stay on schedule now. And of the 27 can uh, events that have canceled, 17 have already rebooked. We have seven conventions scheduled for the new convention center in 2022. Uh, the waterfront park is on schedule. The aquarium is on schedule. Um, it will be transformational, which was one of our goals. Sounds very good. So we have been catching up here this evening with two gentlemen who know downtown Seattle quite well, Brian Surratt and Bob Donegan. Civic Cocktail returns in June with a look back at the year following George Floyd's murder. A lot has happened in Seattle and around the country. We will discuss some of the progress made and steps we still need to take to create more equitable communities. Thank you all so much for watching and good night. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. We are in Civic Cocktail Overtime, time that we have set aside to take more of your questions. Here are a few. Uh, Cam, for, for both Bob Donegan and Brian Surratt, with so many companies allowing work from home indefinitely, is there another vision of the downtown ecosystem other than the coming back to office? This is such a good question. Bob, would you, would you like to go first? So I think that's a question best asked of individual building owners, property owners, or the city regarding parks. There are individual plans to deal with people coming back or not coming back. In my experience, and we've had the Ivers office staff voluntarily work from home, but if they want to come to the office to do tasks, they can do so. We've grown from one or two people coming into the office last summer to on Friday last week, we had seven of the 14 office staff come in because they miss each other. And I think we will see more and more companies, employers downtown, allow people to come back when they want. And we will see a slower recovery than if everything opened up the way it did after 2008 and 2009. Well, Brian, I had a similar question about that in my mm -hmm. mind, you know, some, some companies um, are either, either going, you know, forever remote or hybrid remote. There's all these different permutations, as you know. Uh, that seems like it could slow the recovery because obviously before the pandemic, we didn't have this option so much. Well, there's, um, I, know, I know Bob's a big data guy. Uh, there is a, an economist um, that you should look up. His name is Adam Ozemek. Um, he's uh, the chief economist for uh, Upwork, um, they do a lot of kind of workforce labor uh, uh, um, market matching with, with employers and freelancers. And he did this, this amazing survey in December, this past December, 2020, and trying to understand, okay, what does this work from home dyma dynamic really look like? And um, he laid this out. So I'm gonna go to, so, so uh, right before the pandemic hit, you know, um, working from home full time was about 2% of all uh, US workers um, were working from home. 15% was about uh, um, uh, were going part time. During the early phases of the pandemic, 50% uh, of the workforce were working um, um, from home. 50%. You know, and the, that that shows you also, frankly, how how many workers don't have that flexibility and that privilege to work from home. Our essential workers, uh, folks in the service industry, et cetera. Um, that was 50% of almost two thirds of the population. Now, he estimates that's around 35 to 40%. 
going forward, he was talking to hiring managers, kind of what their is that plan- full time remote that thirty five to forty. That's that's full time remote right now, uh-huh. currently, uh-huh. Oh, as of December of twenty twenty, right. But okay. going forward, post pandemic, this is what hiring managers are starting to plan for. They're planning for about twenty percent uh, full time remote uh, work, and then another about twenty percent um, part time uh, uh, working from remote. Workers want. You know, about about 40 percent wanting that part time, uh, you know, two days at home, three days in the office. Uh, but most companies right now are planning for about 20, 25 percent of their workforce uh, to be working um, some kind of hybrid um, uh, uh, situation. So so I think what we're seeing is, you know, I think the the uh, the doomsday scenario of like, oh, my God, all these these office workers are going to be working from home forever. That's not happening to Bob's point, because at the end of the day, we're human beings and we want social connection. We want that interaction. We want that clustering, not just because of work, but because of all these other things that happen in our lives. And that's the beauty of cities and beauties of downtowns, because people come here because they want an experience. They want that. And so um, if, if, the most successful cities that emerge out of this, they're going to be able to solve that problem. And there's a reason why Amazon's opening up. There's a reason why Apple has made an announcement that they're, they're, they're going to be investing in Seattle. Like they, they know that they need this, this space to bring people in. Well, I had to laugh um, when Amazon made this announcement and maybe just my Twitter feed, um, some Amazon employee, I, I don't remember who it was, um, said, well, you know, what about my two o'clock kayaking, which, you know, <laughs> which is, is funny, but look, people during this time have established new patterns so, of, of what they do, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. like it's mm-hmm. maybe going to a kid's baseball game. Maybe it's, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a run or an early work schedule followed by kayaking. I don't really <laughs> know, but I mean. Joni, we tried having the chefs and the servers work from home the servers would have used drones to deliver to tables and the cooks could cook at home. It didn't work very well. Yeah. Some people actually have the to The drones were work. a little tricky, I'm thinking, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Amanda, for both of you, uh, Bob Downigan and Brian Surratt, Seattle's getting younger. What specific actions can we take to continue to entice young people to live, visit, and spend money downtown? I don't think we have to do anything to entice them. Elliott Bay, Olympic Mountains, <laughs> Mount Rainier. Pre-enticed. Pre-enticed, they're, we call that. They're going to come here, and we're less expensive than San Francisco. So if you look at the in-migration, where people are coming from, it's still cheaper to live here than it is to live in the Bay Area. I don't think we have to do anything to entice them. Do I, we I, have to, Brian? What do you I, say? I, I, I agree with Bob 90% of the way there, that, that young talent is going to want to come to diverse um interesting cities and they want cultural offerings what uh, what i do think we should be thinking about is um, um thinking about our music scene thinking about our art scene like like the the one um you know i guess benefit is i hate to hate that using that word but one 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 opportunity that we have right now post pandemic is that you know the spaces that might not have been affordable two years ago, a year and a half ago, may be more affordable for that, that, that young creative uh, that, you know what, instead of, you know, I don't know, going to as another- As long as it's not a house, those and, are not uh, more affordable. But, but the thing is like young, young folks, I think, I think they, they wanna be in a place where they can meet other folks. And so how do you, how do you think about an art scene and a music scene that's, yeah. that's vibrant and in, in the center city? And I think that's something I think the city can do a, a bit better job in, in, in that because uh, we've got some great um, um, some great assets here and 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 you know the young the young you know capital follows talent and talent wants to come to Seattle so we got to figure it out so we danced around this a little bit earlier this is a question from Jeff for both Bob Donegan and Brian Surratt what are other cities doing right and what can we learn from them what do you think So the Chamber of Commerce every year takes three study missions, one to a city in Washington state, one to another city in the country and one abroad. 
and the chamber tries to find a city that's doing something well and go to that place to learn how they're doing it. Uh -huh. And as an example, when the chamber went to the city of Austin, the city of Austin is issuing permits to build stuff and occupy stuff in a tiny fraction of what Seattle is doing. That's one of the absolutely fastest growing cities right now, uh, especially post pandemic. And that's one thing we could do here to make it much easier to get small businesses, minority businesses who don't know how to navigate the permit process through that process quicker so that they spend less time and less money and they can actually open up. What are you thinking, Brian? I, I don't disagree. I, I think that that is something the city needs to completely rethink um, it, it's, it's, its regulatory regime if we want to really be bold and creative. Um, we're seeing slivers of it, you know, with using the streets to have more activation, uh, but we're only scratching the surface um, on that front. I think we, we can be much more bold. Okay, so I want to touch very briefly on the uh, charter amendment you both alluded to it earlier. Uh, really briefly here, the charter provides housing and services, and then on the other end of it, um, uh, parks and sidewalks, um, the encampments are cleaned. Uh, would like to hear from both of you. Are you for this, both of you? This measure, as you understand, this charter mem measure? Well, we don't know what its final form will be yet, because as recently as last week, yeah. it was being revised and polished. But the polling that the chamber did indicates there's overwhelming support between 70 and 90 percent for the provisions in there. I believe it was 73 percent, right? I remember 71, but you're probably right, Joni. You're better with numbers than I am. But the idea of getting services to people who need them, whether it's drug abuse, alcohol treatment, or mental health services. And if they're willing to do that, getting them in quickly, if they're not willing to do that, getting them out of our parks and out of our schoolyards and off our streets so that the rest of the community feels safe, I support that idea. Now, the devil is always in the details. and We don't it know is. what the details are yet. Brian, what's your position on this? I you know um, I'm supportive. Of, of it and uh, you know is it perfect you know um, is it going to make the impact that we're all hoping for we don't know don't know the answer to that I think the bottom line though is you have not just folks in the business community but you have folks from the provider community um, and others saying you know what's happening right now is a a a, a failing a, a policy failing a moral failing on our city's part and on on the issue of our time and um and it's really um just you know it, it was such a strong statement to saying like we the citizens of seattle saying what's happening right now in our community is no longer acceptable not for the individuals who are experiencing homelessness and not for um, the broader community we've got to be better we have to be better so uh, Martin uh, in our audience has a question for both of you, for Bob Donegan and Brian Surratt. Have there been any efforts to place definitive proposals in front of the city council to address people on the street downtown? That would be a better question to ask someone on the city council staff than me. I know there have been many discussions in the groups that I belong to with city council members and with the mayor's staff and some of those have actually turned into law. But the specifics of uh, what yeah. those proposals are, city people know that better than I do. You, Brian, you used to be a city people. Well, that was three and a half years ago, Joni. Uh, <laughs> well, do you have any from the, from your days? I, 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 you know, I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I think this is, um, I think the issues around homelessness are so complex. You know, obviously, you know, the rising cost of housing is is a driving force. Um, I think um, the challenges of getting physical and mental health services to folks on the street are really critical. And you can't ignore the fact that there's huge racial disparities on those folks who are experiencing homelessness. You know, you know, African Americans, you know, are what five, six percent of the city's population. We're 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 talking about you know 25 percent of the homeless population, our, our urban Native American population. 
of homeless individuals, you know, it's up to what, 10%, 50%, you know, I might not be getting the precise numbers right, but the fact that, that we have these massive uh, disparities just show you how layered and complicated this issue is. And so um, the reality is this is going to take a massive amount of resources to solve this problem, more housing, better services, mental and physical health services for folks um, that are integrated and coordinated. And it's going to require the entire community the business community, um, providers, um, our elected leaders, you know, to really, um, um, to, to, to get, get together. I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful with this charter amendment. I'm hopeful with the regional um, authority uh, that finally that we're talking uh, about this crisis in a regional context, um, that, that we're on the right, the right path, I'm, I'm hopeful. So hold that thought. It's time to wrap this up. We've had a, what, a, what a great show. Thank you so much for the time. And thank you, audience, for some really great questions. Good evening, everyone. Thank you.